All right, Gary. What's your last name, Gary? Stack. Gary Stack. And what school do you go to? Charter Schools of Excellence. Charter Schools of Excellence. Let's welcome Gary here today. Let's pass. All right. And what is your name? Isabel. Isabel. What's your last name, Isabel? Padilla. Isabel Padilla. And what school do you go to, Isabel? Hollywood Christian School. Hollywood Christian School right here. All right. Let's pass the microphone on to this next good-looking gentleman. So so what is your name? Coda. Coda. What's your last name, Coda? Espinosa. Coda Espinosa. And what school do you go to? Hollywood Christian. Hollywood Christian. All right. Okay, so, so next, tell us what grade you're in. What grade are you in, Coda? Se second. Second grade. And, and who is your teacher? Miss Needs. Miss Needs. Where's Miss Needs? Is she here? I'm, uh, I think I saw Miss Needs somewhere. This is one of Miss Needs' students, okay? Let's give the microphone back to Isabel. So, so Isabel, what grade are you in? Second grade. Second grade. And who is your teacher? Miss Arroyo. Miss Arroyo. Is Miss Arroyo here? All right. She's back there as well, all right? And let's give Gary a chance here. Gary, what grade are you in? First. First grade. All right. And what is the name of your teacher? Miss Pierre. All right, I don't think Miss Pierre is here today, but I'm sure glad. I, she does. She doesn't come to this church. She doesn't. Well, you're going to have to invite her. You're going to have to invite her. Maybe next week you can you can bring her here. All right. Hey, so 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 let's start. So Gary, tell us what is your favorite thing about school? Learning. Learning. All right. So so. So tell us something, tell us something that you learned this last week. What did you learn this last week? Math. Math, all right. So can you tell us something about math that you learned? First grade math. What's that? First grade math. Oh, first grade math, all right. All right, so like you're not taking advanced algebra or anything like that? <laughs> Trigonometry or anything like that, huh? Yeah. Uh, all right, all right. I Isabel, so... What is your favorite thing about school? Learning. Learning to, boy, we got some studious. We probably have some uh, doctors and professors here in just a second. So, so, so what's your favorite subject? Science. Science. Okay, okay. Can you tell us something you learned about science? Is there anything that you learned that you can share with us? Observing. Observing. Wow, that's fantastic. So as you observe the world around you, you're able to learn a little bit more about science. Isn't that right? Fantastic. And let's give Coda a chance. So Coda, what is your favorite subject? Math. Math. All right. Math. So um, uh, um, I'm trying to think of a math question to ask them, but he probably knows more than I do. Math was never, math was never my forte. So, so Coda, tell us, did anything exciting happen this first week of school as you got back to school and you got back in the routine? Anything exciting happen in your class? No, no just, uh, <laughs> just, uh, just a normal uh, everyday uh, day, right? Is, is Miss Needs a good teacher? Is, yes. She, she, she is a good teacher. All right. All right. So, so, so let's give Isabella a chance. Isabella, anything exciting happened for you at school this week? No. Nothing either. <laughs> Nothing either. And it, it has just been the first week, right? It has just been the first week. You've been able to meet some new friends? Yes. Yeah? Yeah. So, so what's your favorite lunch? Do you pack your lunch or do you buy your lunch at school? Pack yeah. So what's your favorite thing you like to eat? Boy, I'm putting you on the spot here, aren't I? Putting you on the spot, huh? Well, you can think about that. You can think about that. Let's say, Gary, so, so Gary, did anything, I know the answer to this, did anything exciting happen to you this first week of school? No. <laughs> well, I know that's not true because something exciting yeah. happened the first yeah. day of school to you. So yeah. tell us, what happened on the first day of school? My tooth fell out. Their tooth <laughs> fell out on the first day of school. All right, now, now nobody punched you in the mouth or anything, right? It no. just it, it just fell out, right? Fell out. And from what I understand, you've had another tooth that's fallen out since then, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I would say by the time the school's out, you're not going to have any teeth left, right? <laughs> huh? You're, you're losing them at a pretty fast rate right there. 
All right, so, so um, Gary, what's your favorite subject? Math. Oh, I already asked you that, didn't I? You see, when you start getting old, you get senile, and Math. You, start, you start losing all of those Math. things. Math is your favorite one. All right, so have you made new friends at school this year? Have you made new friends? That's fantastic. So if your teacher was here today and you could tell your teacher one thing, what would you tell your teacher, Gary? What would you tell, if you could tell her one thing, what would you tell your teacher? I know. Yeah, you don't know? Okay. Is it, anybody have you, what would you tell your teacher, Isabel? Do you have any idea? She's actually out there, so you can tell her if you have an opportunity. Would you say something to your teacher? We're putting you on the spot, huh? We're putting you on the spot. Hey, so let me ask you. Let me ask you. So, in your class, Isabel, I know you go to Hollywood Christian School. So, so do you study the Bible in your class? Yes. yes. Do you remember anything you studied this week in your class? In, in Bible class, do you remember anything? The story about Abraham. The story about Abraham. That's fantastic. Fantastic. And let me ask Coda. So, Coda. I understand, I'm going to put you on the spot. I heard in your class this week that you made a really important decision this week. And in your class, you trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Is that true? Is that true? Yes. We want you to know, Coda, we are so very happy for you. We are. And we're happy for all of these kids. Didn't they do a great job? Let's give them a hand. Thank you, moms and dads. Thank you. You can go back and, and have your seat. Thank you. Hey, they did a great job. As a matter of fact, you're always worried when you put a microphone in kids' hands. You're like, okay, what are they going to say? Well, here's the idea for that, and obviously there's nothing more fun than uh, bringing little kids up front. But the simple truth is that as a church, as schools, and as parents, we have a huge responsibility towards these precious children. We have a responsibility to make sure that they are on the right path, that they are headed in the right direction, a direction that will enable them to become fruitful and productive citizens of our community. But not only that, we have a responsibility to make sure that they are going to become fruitful and productive citizens of the kingdom of God. That's why Hollywood Community Church exists. That's why Hollywood Christian School exists. And so I, I want to chat just a little bit about that this morning. And so if you have your Bible, turn with me to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 22. I want to read just a few verses, actually tying into one verse, as we see our responsibility today as a church as teachers, and not only teachers here at Hollywood Christian School, but we have public school teachers that are here today. We have homeschool parents that are here today. Anybody who's involved in the training of a child, we want to let you know today how very much we appreciate you. And we want to challenge you, but not only that, I want to challenge moms and dads. I want to challenge moms and dads and, and grandparents to be actively involved in pointing our kids and the direction that God would have for them to go. So today we're in Proverbs chapter 22. Let me just say before I, I read the passage, I, I, I don't want to miss an opportunity. Thank you so much for those of us, those of you who are praying for us as a family this week. Uh, once again, we had a, a challenge. Vicki was in the hospital for a couple of days, and, and she's home now. And so I know many of you were praying for us, and so we thank you so very much for that. Proverbs chapter 22, I want to read the first six verses. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, and favor is better than silver or gold. The rich and the poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. The prudent sees danger and hides himself, but the simple go on and suffer for it. The reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches, honor, and life. Thorns and snares are in the way of the crooked. Whoever guards his soul will keep far from them. Notice this verse. This is the verse I really want us to see today. Train up a child in the way he is old, in the way he should go, excuse me. Even when he is old, he will not depart 
from it. Would you read that with me? Let's read that together as a church today. Verse 6, Proverbs 22, 6. Let's read it together. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, if you have a daughter today, that verse equally applies to your daughter, right? And so we could equally put the pronoun she in there for he. Let's pray together today. Lord, I, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. Thank you for these precious little ones, for Gary and Isabel and Coda and scores of other kids that are part of our church family, that are part of our school family. We're so honored for the privilege that we have to minister to them and to minister in their lives. Thank you for mom and dads who are here today who uh, realize the need to partner with us, to partner together, to put their children, their, uh, their young people, their teenagers on the right path. God, I pray you'd help us to understand exactly what it is as, as uh, the sage of the book of Proverbs, as the Holy Spirit of God teaches us from this passage of scripture today. And we thank you for what you're going to show us. Help us to be godly teachers. Help us to be godly moms and dads. Help us to point our kids to Jesus with a passion. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. If you've, if you've spent much time in the Bible, you know that the book of Proverbs is unique compared to the other 65 books of the Bible. It's a, it's a book of wisdom. It's wisdom literature. It's kind of lumped in with Psalms and Job and Song of Solomon as part of wisdom literature. While other books of the Bible tell uh, heroic stories and teach us deep theological truths and uh, at times even make prophetic predictions, the book of Proverbs has a different purpose. The book of Proverbs was written to simply teach us the wisdom of God. In other words, to impart God's wisdom to his people. And so as a result, this book was written in a unique way. It's not like, you know, the chapters flow together and you can do an exegetical, expositional study of an entire chapter. Almost every verse is different. Every chapter contains a list of different and distinct proverbs, all of them equally wise, all of them applicable to our lives. And so it was written for the purpose of understanding it easy, but also writing it in a way that it is easy for us to remember. Today's text, specifically verse 6, deals with children. Maybe more importantly, it deals with parents. More importantly, it deals with individuals who are involved in the lives of children, challenging us, telling us the importance of pointing our children in the right direction, to make sure that they are headed the right way, to make sure that they don't mess up their lives to the contrary, to make sure that they live a life that not only is successful and productive in our community, but as we'll see today, a life that is actually headed and pointed towards someone, not just some place, someone, and that person is Jesus Christ. So just a couple of simple things that I want to share with you today, and I want to be extremely practical today. The first thing that we see in this verse, verse 6, is an encouragement to train. And, and I want to say something from the very beginning so that we understand uh, this verse. So, so catch this. This verse is not a promise. This verse is a proverb. This verse is not a promise. It's a proverb. In other words, I say that because God is not guaranteeing that if you do these three things that your children will end up on the right path. All of us have known godly parents who did the very best that they could, whose desire it was to point their kids in the right direction, yet whose children unfortunately took a different path. 
Maybe you're here like that today. Maybe you've raised your children and you, uh, you desired for them to love Jesus and to be part of a body like ours, and you actually taught them and trained them to do that, and yet for some reason right now, they're taking a different path and they're far away from God. I don't want to use this verse as a hammer to beat you up and said, man, you blew it. If you'd have done these three things, your children would not have gone that direction. <laughs> I have many pastor friends whose children have taken a different path. And so uh, I want us to catch today that this is not a promise that God is saying, if you do these things, that your children will take the right path. He is saying, though, and here's what I want us to catch. He is saying that if we intentionally, if we purposefully point our kids in the right direction, it is much easier, it is much more probable that they will learn to live a life that pleases and honors God. In other words, I believe that the writer of Proverbs is saying, listen, the, the onus, the responsibility is on us. Those who work in the lives of kids, it is our responsibility. The second thing I want you to see from the verse is this, the meaning of the word train. Because the word train in Proverbs 22.6 is an interesting word. The word train refers to an act of dedication. In the Old Testament, it refers to an act of dedication. This word is only used three times in the Old Testament. It's used here in Proverbs chapter 22, and it's used on two other occasions in which the verse is used talking about the dedication of the temple. When other Solomon and, and the children of Israel were dedicating the temple, this is the word that was used, and the word is translated on those two other uh, occasions as dedication. So, so, so here's what I want you to see, and here's what I believe the writer of Proverbs is saying. Godly children do not happen by luck. Godly children do not accidentally end up on the right path. This verse speaks of an intentional, consistent, God-dependent shepherding of our children's hearts. It speaks of a lifelong journey. It doesn't talk about one act of dedication because you could say, man, I dedicated my child when they were a kid. It doesn't talk about one act of dedication, but rather a lifelong journey in which we are constantly teaching, we are constantly showing, we are constantly encouraging our children to have a passionate relationship with Jesus Christ. And so when the writer of Proverbs says, train up a child in the way he should go, he's talking about this lifelong determination to make sure that our children end up on the right path. The third thing that I would say, just by introduction, is this. It takes a team to direct a child's path towards God. It takes a team. There's an African proverb which states, it takes a village to raise a child. You've heard that phrase before. Hillary Clinton made that phrase famous writing a book of a similar title, It Takes a Village. The idea is this. It takes an entire community of different people interacting with children in order for a child to experience and grow in a safe environment. Listen to me, church. If, if that is true for society at large, that is equally true for God's kingdom. It doesn't mean that it's my responsibility to raise your children. It doesn't mean that it's your responsibility to raise mine. But it does mean that we should be a team. We should be focused on raising up a generation of Christ followers. So today, we lock arms. I'm not going to have you literally do it, but we lock arms. It's almost like you look at the person beside you, and you lock arms, and you look at the person on the other side of you, and you lock arms, and we say, okay, we are a spiritual village. And as a team, we are committed to raising up the next generation of kids who are going to make a difference in our world, kids who are going to make a difference for the kingdom of God. Does that make sense, church? 
And so when the writer of Proverbs says, train up a child in the way he should go, he's not just speaking to moms and dads. He's not just speaking to teachers. He's speaking to all of us, a church community as a whole, as we lock arms and say, it is our job to raise up our kids in a way that they will actively and aggressively pursue after Jesus Christ. So today I want to do two things. I want to give an encouragement to teachers today, and I want to give an exhortation to parents. Parents slash grandparents slash aunts, uncles, whatever your role is in the lives of kids today. So today I want to begin by encouraging and by recognizing teachers. So all over our building today, we have people who are professional educators. And so I want to ask, I want to do this a little bit in phases, and I want to have you stand. I first of all want to take a second, and I want to recognize the educators of Hollywood Christian School. And so if you're here today, and you're a part of administration, or you're a teacher here at Hollywood Christian School, would you stand? We want to recognize you today. Would you stand, teachers, all over the building? Some in the balcony. We're here. Of course, led by Dr. Mike Hill, our, our head of school, we want you to know how very much we appreciate you. Remain standing. We have part of our team that's just giving you a gift today. So, so remain standing. Now I want to go a step further. If you're a public school teacher, if you're involved in public school, or maybe you teach at another Christian school that's not Hollywood Christian School, and you're a part of our fellowship today, would you stand all over the building, our public school teachers and teachers that serve in different places around our community? Would you stand today? Because we equally recognize you, and we want you to know how very much we appreciate you. And I want to recognize one, one more group, so don't sit down, all right? Don't sit down. If you're a homeschool parent, if you're a homeschool parent and you are teaching your kids from home and you're actively involved in the education of your kids, would you stand today? Homeschool parents, and let's recognize them. So, so before, before I have a word of prayer for you, teachers, I want you to know this. I have a huge amount of admiration for you. We probably don't tell you enough how much we appreciate you and the influence that you have made and you are making in the lives of students, but I have a huge amount of admiration and respect for what you do. I frequently say, you couldn't pay me enough to do what you do. And I know that's probably a little ironic because you would sit back today and say, Brian, teachers aren't paid near what they ought to be paid. And I recognize that. But man, you couldn't pay me enough. I tell teachers all the time, if you put me in a classroom with about 15 kids, by 10 o'clock in the morning, I'd be waving the white flag. You know, I, I'd be the guy that would be looking out the door yelling, help, get me out of here. All right? I can't imagine. Um, eight hours a day, however many days it is, or how many hours a day that you're in your classroom with your kids infusing into them. Your dedication, your hard work, your patience is incredibly admirable. And like the Apostle Paul, we want you to know today how much we appreciate your work of faith, how much we appreciate your labor of love, and how much we appreciate your enduring hope as you work in the lives of kids. So today, can we have a word of prayer? I want to have a prayer of dedication for these teachers that are spread all over Broward and Dade County, working in the lives of kids. We recognize you today. We honor you, and I want to have a word of prayer for you today. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for each of these educators. Father, th these individuals are, have prepared themselves they have educated themselves for the purpose of ministering, teaching, preparing the next generation of students and leaders. We thank you for them. Father, whether they teach at Hollywood Christian School or whether they teach in the public school or whether they're homeschool parents, whether they teach in a, another private school in our community, whatever it is, God, I just pray that you would use them in a great way. I pray that you would keep that fire burning in their hearts, the passion that they have to educate. Help that fire to continue burning in their hearts. And God, I pray that you would use them wherever they are. Use them as shining lights 
for Jesus Christ. Help them to make a difference, not only in this life, but I pray you'd help them to make a difference in the life to come. We thank you for each and every one of these educators, and it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Let's let them know again how much we appreciate them. You may be seated. So teachers today, I want to challenge you with three simple thoughts. Because I believe that this, that this passage of Scripture speaks directly to you. Train up a child in the way he or she should go. How is that accomplished? Let me, let me challenge you with three simple thoughts. The first is this. Remember your passion. Teachers, remember your passion. I challenge our staff on a regular basis. It's, it's so exciting to see them come in that first day of school. That first day of school, they're so excited, and they're so passionate, and they have so much energy. They've been off during the summer, and they're ready to go. And to see uh, that energy kind of dissipate as the year goes on, and I see uh, the pressures of teaching and all of that kind of wear on them during the eight or nine months of the school year. But teachers, I would encourage you to remember your passion. What is it that drives you as a teacher? Why did you become a teacher in the first place? What was, what was your original passion? I read this week that 75% of educators became teachers because they wanted to make a difference in the lives of students. They didn't become educators because of the pay. They didn't become educators necessarily of any personal goals or aspirations that they had. They simply wanted to make a difference in the lives of students. I'm sure that if we pulled the teachers that are here today, we would find a similar statistic. You do what you do to positively, to positively influence the life of students. Uh, I would also say, and I've read the last couple of weeks and kind of prepping my mind and heart for this, and so teachers, this might be a phrase that you're familiar with. I kind of just uh, learned it this week, but um, teachers teach for what they call light bulb moments. Teachers, you know what I'm talking about, light bulb moments? When all of a sudden you're teaching the student and the light comes on. You know what I'm talking about, the moment when a, a student gets it. There's something that they didn't understand. There's something that they just couldn't get. And because of your influence, because of your patience, because of your teaching, all of a sudden, the light comes on. And whether it's a math concept or whether it's a life concept, whatever it is, you as a teacher get to experience that life bulb moment. When you realize that, when the student realizes that the information that you are giving him or her will do more than just help them pass a test, it will help them live life. So, so, so here's my thought today. Teachers, don't lose your passion. It is your passion for knowledge. It is your passion for imparting information that inspires your students to learn. Hold on to that passion. I used to always, and it's completely different, I used to train missionaries, and missionaries would day after day, month after month, have to go in and, and, and kind of talk about the same story and, and present the same material, and missionaries would come and they said, Brian, I do this day after day, how do I maintain my passion for what I do? And the, and the recommendation that I gave them, I think, would apply to teachers as well. Stay on your knees. If for some reason you begin losing that passion, stay on your knees and stay on your knees until God reignites that passion in your heart. And each and every day, he reminds you why you are where you are and what God wants you to do. Teachers, let me give you a second thing. Realize your calling. Realize your calling. Here's what I mean. God has called you to be a teacher. Uh, I believe that just as God calls preachers into ministry, I believe that God calls teachers into education. As a matter of fact, I believe that whatever you're doing, God has called you to do that, but specifically teachers, you are called by God. And I would encourage you to be convinced each and every day that you are exactly where God wants you to be. That fact is true, not just for Christian school teachers, but for public school teachers as well. 
Here are three tremendous verses, teachers. If I could get these verses to kind of stick in your mind and heart this week and this year. Notice Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. Jesus says this, you are the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hidden. Verse 15, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand so that it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light so shine so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Teachers, whether you're at Hollywood Christian School, um, another school, wherever you are, let your light shine. That brings me to the third thing that I would say, and it's simply this. Use your influence. Use your influence. Teachers, you have been given an a position of unbelievable influence. Use your influence to represent Jesus Christ. I know depending upon your school and where you work and minister, that's different. So let me just challenge our Christian school teachers here for just a moment. The primary goal of Christian education must be the salvation and discipleship of students. We've shared that with our teachers here at Hollywood Christian School this last week. Dr. Hill and myself, for the last few weeks, we've challenged them that in the process of teaching all of the subjects and helping our students to match the subjects, we must point them to Jesus Christ. Because we certainly do not want to educate the mind and not change the heart. How sad would it be for our graduates to graduate from Hollywood Christian School or from another Christian uh, school and be highly educated, but for those students to not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we would have failed. But I also challenge public school teachers to use your influence. I know that you're limited. I know in the public school, you can't start off the day saying, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to read the book of Romans this morning. You can't do that. You can't stand up in your classroom and say, thus saith the Lord, and preach to your students. You probably wouldn't have a job for very long. You cannot pray in the classroom. You cannot read the Bible in the classroom. But teachers, let me challenge you with this. You can pray and ask God to help you change lives. You can do that. And God can use you to change lives. God is big enough to do something through you without you standing up and preaching to your students. God can use you in a powerful way in the public school classroom to impact not only the lives of your students, but the lives of those families as well. So I would challenge you, pray, serve, love, trust God to give you divine opportunities, divine appointments to make an eternal difference. So when the writer of Proverbs says, train up a child in the way he should go. Part of that team are those teachers, those godly men and women that God is using wherever to point those children in the right direction. But I, I want to pause for a second because not only do I want to give an encouragement to teachers, but I want to give an exhortation to parents today. It's not easy to raise children. Can I get an Amen. It's not easy to raise children. It seems like everyone everywhere is against us. The devil fights against us. The world and the flesh fight against us. The culture is against us. Parents, would you agree with me? It's like we're on an uphill journey. It seems like the current, the flow, everything is against us as we try to fulfill what Proverbs 22 tells us. It is so easy to be frustrated. God gives you these little gifts and you do the best you can. You hope, you pray that someday when the job is done, your kids will be a success and they will follow the Lord. Only parents know the joy, the tears, the worry, the anguish, and the fears. Mom and dads, are you with me today? And by the way, it doesn't change when your kids get older. 
doesn't change when they move out of the house. It's not like, okay, man, those kids are gone. I never have to worry about them again. Those of you that have adult kids know exactly what I'm talking about. The worry is still there. The fear is still there. They still cost us money, even though there's a, the, the, they're adults. Are you with me? Can I get an amen? amen. Raising kids is difficult. Parents, the academic, social, and spiritual maturity of your children is your responsibility. Let me say that again. The academic, social, spiritual maturity of your children is your responsibility. You are more responsible than your child's teacher. You are more responsible for the direction of your child than your child's children's ministry director, than your child's middle school director, or than your child's youth pastor. You play a pivotal role in the life of your child in every single area. And let me just say something. If I could bring teachers up here today, I know they would like, Brian, give me that microphone for just a second, all right? Support your kids' teachers. All right, when your teachers work in the lives of your kids, support your kids' teachers. I think everybody would say the culture has changed. Whenever kids used to come home in my generation and say, Dad, I got in trouble, my dad used to have a standing rule. You get paddled at school, you get paddled at home. All right, you get in trouble at school, you get in trouble at home. But for some reason, the mentality has changed. And now whenever a child struggles at school, whenever a child gets in trouble at school, it's not the student's fault, it's the teacher's fault. Don't blame your teachers. Support your teachers. We are a team. And it's only working together as a team that we can accomplish what God wants us to accomplish in the lives of our kids. Teachers, I didn't have that plan, but I just kind of said that. And so I kind of wanted to support you today. So if you're following along, moms and dads, here's a couple of things, not deep, not profound today, very practical, but I want you to catch this, moms and dads. First of all, you are the number one spiritual influence in the life of your child. Mom, dad, double parent home, single parent home, whatever the condition of your home, you are the number one spiritual influencer in the life of your child. Let me show you a, a verse. I want to give you just part of a verse as we start and kind of play with it just a second. But notice Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 3. The end of Ephesians chapter 5 and the beginning of Ephesians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul gives us the largest exhortation on the home in Scripture. And we come to chapter 6 and he gives an exhortation. And, and the term fathers there is not just talking about dads there, but I believe it's talking about parents in general. And so it says this, fathers, parents, don't provoke your children to anger, but. And so he says, don't do this, but here's what I'm going to encourage you to do. All right, so before I finish the verse, let's talk about what he doesn't say in the verse. He doesn't say, parents, don't provoke your kids to anger, but make sure they get a quality education. It's not what he says in the passage. He doesn't say, parents, don't provoke your kids to anger, but make sure they get into a good college. He doesn't say, parents, don't provoke your kids to anger, but make sure that they play sports. That is so important for them. Make sure they do that. He doesn't say, make sure they dress in the latest fashions or that they have their own iPhone or that they visit Disney World frequently. Now, don't get me wrong. None of those things are wrong. And all of us want our kids to have a good education, go to a good college, play sports. Have a, maybe we don't want them to have an iPhone yet. I don't know what it is, but, but none of those things are wrong. None of them are bad. As a matter of fact, most of them are good. But they must not be substitutes for what God has commanded us to do. I'm, I'm afraid. Can I be really transparent here today? I'm afraid even as Christian parents, we've allowed the culture to influence us. It's not that we don't want our kids to have a relationship with Jesus. It's just that other things become more important. We want our kids to have this, 
We want our kids to experience this. We want our kids to be accepted by them. We want our kids to play all of these things. We want our kids to do this, 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 and this. And in the process, moms and dads, we're losing our kids. The church is losing this generation in droves. They're leaving the church. And we can sit back and say, well, if we did more progressive worship music or if we did this. Listen, listen, it doesn't start in the church. Here's where it starts, in the home. That's where it starts. So, so here's what Paul says in Ephesians 6.3. Notice what Paul says. Fathers, parents, do not provoke your children to anger, but, what does he say? Bring them up in the nurture, in the admonition of the Lord. What is Paul saying? Paul is saying his parents, you are the number one spiritual influence in the life of your child. You are the number one spiritual influence in the life of your children. Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Here in Proverbs chapter 22, we could pull five or six principles, biblical, godly principles that we need to instill in the lives of our children. Let me just mention them quickly. In verse one, he talks about pre that parents should teach their children integrity. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches and favor rather than silver or gold. Verse 2 teaches us that, or tells us that we should teach our kids impartiality. The rich and the poor meet together. The Lord's the maker of them all. Where does prejudice begin? Begins at home. <laughs> Begins at home. So, so we have a responsibility to train our kids to be impartial, to realize that God is the one who made everybody regardless of ethnicity, regardless of socioeconomic status that begins at home. We should teach our children humility. Verse 4, the reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. We should teach our kids responsibility. Notice verse 7, the rich rules over the poor and the borrower is slave to the lender. And we should teach our children generosity. Verse 9, whoever has a bountiful eye will be blessed for he shares his bread with the poor. <laughs> Here's what the writer of Proverbs is telling us. It's our job to take those spiritual truths and teach them, inculcate them, drive them into the mind and in the heart of our child. But there's a second thing, and here's what I really want you to see, and we'll be done shortly. He says, train up a child in the way he or she should go. What is the way to which the writer is referring? Theologians and commentators have kind of debated this through the years. So when he says train up a child in the way he or she should go, what is he talking about? What is, what is the phrase way to what is it referring? Some would say, oh, you got to help them chart their own path. And if you look at modern versions of this book, or of, uh, of the book of Proverbs, it's actually been translated, train up a child in the way he or she would go. And the idea is it's your job to find out what are the passions of that child, where they want to go, and you just help them be what they want to be. I don't believe that's what the writer of Proverbs is talking about. Others would say, no, 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 train them means that we need to isolate them. We need to pull them away from the world. We don't want the world to influence them, so we got to isolate them. We have to indoctrinate them. We have to protect them from the world, and some families do that. They actually isolate their kids to such a degree that the kids are not exposed to the world. What happens is eventually that child is going to be exposed to the world, and eventually the world is going to look pretty attractive to that child. That's not, I don't believe, what the writer of Proverbs is talking about. Train up a child in the way he should go. Let me just kind of, I want to compare that verse with one verse that you know. Make a couple of practical applications and we'll be done. What, what does the way mean? 
me show you, remind you of a verse in the New Testament. We just studied it not long ago. In John chapter 14, where Jesus made this statement. And Jesus answered, I am, what does he say? The way. Would, would you read that phrase with me again? Jesus answered, I am the way. So what is the way that your child should go? What, what is the path that God desires for your child to take? What, what are the important principles that you, more than anything else, should be instilling in the life of your child or your grandchildren or the children in your life? If you don't hear anything else I've said all day long, catch this. Moms and dads, your primary function as a parent is to point your child to Jesus. Your primary function is to point your child to Jesus. For some reason, that's kind of dipped on our priority list. Other things that take, seem to take prominence seem to take preeminence in our lives. It's not that we don't want our kids to have a relationship with Jesus. It's just that other things become more urgent in our lives. Life's a rat race. Well, I want to make sure that they experience this, and I want to make sure that they experience that, and I want to make sure that they do this. And before we know it, our kids are 15, 16, 17 years old, and they're more interested in other things than they are in Jesus Christ. And we sit back and ask ourselves the question, what happened? What went wrong? Why don't my kids love Jesus as much as I love Jesus? Once again, we go back to the very beginning. Train up a child, dedicate a child in the way he or she should go. And when they are older, they will not depart from it. I'm telling you, moms and dads, if you will sit back and with passion, with vibrancy, with urgency, point your child, your teenager, your youth to Jesus Christ, that is the very best chance that you have to make sure that they're in the right way, that they're where, that they're who God wants them to become. So you sit back today and say, okay, Brian, how, how do you do that? Is there a class that I teach? Is there something that I should get involved in? I think it's really simple. I think we try to complicate it over and over and over again. I think it's really simple. So catch this today. The best way to assure that your kids have a vibrant, passionate, flurrying relationship with Jesus Christ, catch this, is for you to have a vibrant, passion, and flurrying relationship with Jesus Christ. Not profound, not deep, not philosophic, philosophical. The best way for your kids to love Jesus is for you to love Jesus. And for you to love him with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, for your life to be centered on Jesus. When your child sees a mom and dad who is sincere, a mom and dad who is real, a mom or dad who is consistent, a mom or dad that even though they blow it, they have a humble heart and they ask for forgiveness and they always turn to Jesus Christ. When your child sees that in their life and your your life, the Holy Spirit of God will do something in the life of that child that will give them a desire to want what dad has or to want what mom has. But I'm telling you right now, if you're apathetic to the things of God, if you're indifferent to the things of God, if Jesus is not first in your life, if other things are first in your life, what are your kids going to pursue after? They're going to pursue after what you are pursuing after. 
So the best thing that we can do is be an example to our kids. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Why is that? Because you have little eyes that are watching you all the time. Wives, respond to your husbands as the church responds to Jesus Christ. Why is that? Because you have little eyes that are watching you all the time. Learn to respond with love and compassion. Why is that? Because you have little eyes that are watching you all the time. Make much of Jesus. Make much of his church. Elevate your relationship with Jesus Christ and watch your kids follow Apathetic Christians, apathetic moms and dads produce apathetic kids. Once again, this is not a promise. It's not a, a guarantee, but it's a proverb. So why saying, saying moms and dads, do you want to have a child who is in the way that God wants them to be? Then do this. You train up, you dedicate your child in the way he or she should go. You point them in the right direction. You say, come here, that's the way you should go. That's the way I'm going. I want you to go with me. And even when they're older, they will not depart from it. Oh, may God help us as a church. May God help us as schools. May God help us as community to raise up a generation that love Jesus more than anyone or anything. Steve and the team are going to come. Here's our walkaway point today that I want you to catch. Our walkaway point very simply is this. Education, and I believe in education, all right? I've gone, gotten my degrees. My, both my boys just finished up their MDibs, and they're starting on their doctor's degrees really soon. I believe with all of my heart in education. Education will make our children better citizens of the community. But only the gospel of Jesus Christ will make our kids citizens of the kingdom. And I think to a certain degree we fail if we make our kids better citizens of the community, but they do not become citizens of the kingdom of God. Let's point our kids to Jesus Christ with a passion, with a vibrancy, with a fervency. Let's love Jesus with all our heart and soul and mind and watch our kids follow us. Would you stand with me and we'll pray together today. Lord, you've given us a huge responsibility. We're stewards. We are stewards of these precious little ones, whether they're first graders like Gary and Isabel and, and Coda, whether they're in middle school, whether they're in high school, Father, we, we are stewards of the children who you have given to us. Help us to be responsible. Help us to realize the ultimate responsibility that we have to point our kids to you. Father, we are the disciple makers in the lives of our kids. Help us to be passionate vibrant disciples of Jesus Christ. Help our relationship with you to be real. Help it to be transparent, not perfect, but transparent. Help us to be forgiving. Help us to be loving. Help us to be the living representatives of Jesus Christ in our home. Oh God, help us to be husbands that love our wives. Help us to be wives that love our husbands. Help us to be moms and dads who live out the principles of the gospel day in and day out. As our kids look to us, may they desire to have the relationship with you that we have with you. Help us to train our kids in the way that they should go. And we're going to trust you to keep them on
So Lord, today we thank you for everyone involved in the training, the pointing, the directing of our kids' lives. Father, I pray you'd help us as a team, as a village, to lock arms and to raise up a generation of passionate followers of Jesus Christ. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.